Hello and welcome everybody to this presentation where we would like to introduce to you our latest addition to our solver family, the brand new Express Global Solver. And the host of this presentation will be me and my colleague Tristan Galli. And we are happy to um, yeah, guide you through this presentation today. Thanks, Timo, and welcome everyone to our presentation about the new FICO Express Global. Okay. Thanks, Tristan, and let's go into the presentation. So as you might be aware, FICO Express optimization consists of various components. They're all built on top of each other and nicely integrate within each other. And from your application and your company, uh, you might enter the stack that we see here at different levels. You might use one of our business solutions or directly work with our software components. Like you might develop your models in Express Workbench, our in-house IDE for optimization, deploy them via Insight to cooperate with your colleagues on the cloud, and probably you develop your models in Moselle or in Python, or you use the solver directly via one of our APIs in various different programming languages. And speaking of the solver, this is where we, Tristan and I, work down here in the deepest, in the lilac level, and we will tell you today about a great new edition of our uh, solver portfolio. And that's Global Solver, also called Express Global. And we will use these two terms, uh, Express Global and Global Solver interchangeably throughout this video. There are three main pillars of development for the solver team, performance, features, and robustness. And these are the things that we work on in each and every release. So, of course, we strive to make our wide variety of optimization algorithms and solvers for various types of optimization problems faster and faster with every release. Then secondly, we want to make your life more convenient and open new optimization applications by offering new modeling capabilities, uh, enhancing analysis tools, and other variable features. The final goal is numerical robustness, with the expressed MIP and the LP server already being the most deterministic and probably the most numerically robust server. And the Express Global touches on all of these three goals. For most, it is a great new feature that allows you to solve problems that you could not solve before and extends our already wide um, portfolio of different optimization techniques above and beyond all offerings that I'm aware of. Of course, performance was a key factor as we um, wanted to enter this new market in a strong position. And uh, certainly the Express Global Solver will be deterministic. And while numerics are a bigger issue in the nonlinear optimization context than in linear, we took great care of this as well. So without further ado, let's get into the topic. And today's agenda starts with an overview of what MINAP and global optimization is all about. Then we will get an introduction into the technical details of the Express Global Solver implementation, an overview of ways for you to use the solver, and then finally, there will even be a small live demonstration. And that being said, if you're looking for um, other news from the Express 9.0 release, those will be presented in a different video, which hopefully then on YouTube should link up here or down below on some other devices, and in any way, we will include a link at the end of the presentation. So why are we doing this in the first place? Well, you could argue that the world is nonlinear. Many optimization applications are well, inherently nonlinear, and there's no golden way around this. If you need to model chemical reactions of substances or the physical processes when dealing with liquids or gases, you will often get polynomial terms involved. If your engineering involves electromagnetic components, chances are that trigonometric functions will appear in your models. And if you want to represent growth processes accurately, exponential terms are not far away. Well, if you have a MIP solver, everything might look uh, as a MIP to you. And hence, some people say that you have to inevitably linearize all those problems maybe even with some kind of semi-automatic process such that a software does this for you and then boom, after this reformulation, you can apply your good old MIP solver directly. Well, in reality, this often works so and so at best. A priori linearizations can be arbitrarily bad with respect to 
both the feasibility of your model, of your original nonlinear model that is, and the optimality of the solution. Uh, you don't really want it. If you want to counter that by fine uh, granulate, granulated linearizations, then models quickly become prohibitively large. So we will see that indeed a true global nonlinear solver also uses linearizations a lot, but in a very dynamic and adaptive way, and it also exploits the nonlinear structure in many other ways to give solutions that are much more accurate and suited for your problem than what a coarse approximation might give you. So before we formally define what mixed integer nonlinear programming and global optimization are, let's take one step back and remind ourselves what linear and mixed integer optimization actually where and why at least the first class is a relative easy problem class. So linear program is an optimization problem where you minimize a linear objective function over a set of linear constraints and the variables are required to take well, arbitrary real values. Geometrically, this means finding the point in the polyhedron that is furthest in a certain direction, the objective. And mathematically, that is easy because we are optimizing a convex function over a convex set. Mixed integer programming also optimizes a linear function over a set of linear constraints, but now some or even all of the variables can take integer values. And this is a much harder problem because now the uh, feasible set is not even connected anymore. Like uh, here on the left, you have uh, one integer and one continuous variable. And your set of feasible solutions are those dark blue lines here. And if both variables need to be integer, the feasible set reduces to seven individual points. What allows you to powerfully solve MIPS with solvers like Express is the fact that you can at least solve the so-called relaxation efficiently. Relaxation means you drop the integrality constraints. And in our examples here, we are back to the efficient LP case, uh, which is easy to solve and you work your way from integrality uh, down there, you could argue. So, okay, let's go next level. Um, a mixed integer nonlinear program or MINLP is an optimization problem where you minimize an arbitrary nonlinear function over a set of arbitrary nonlinear constraints. And some variables need to be integer. Of course, there's again the continuous variation of MINLP, that's then N. NLP nonlinear program where all variables are real valued and not integer. And in MNLP, the crucial question is whether all involved nonlinear functions are convex or not. We have seen that convexity played a big role in the reasoning why LP is easy, and the same applies here. Continuous NLPs where all constraints and the objective are convex are almost as easy as LP from a theoretic side. Still, they are somewhat technically harder from a practice to the side, but that's mostly manageable. A key reason for this is the fact that from convexity, local optimality implies global optimality. And we will come to that difference in a bit. So let me first note that the fun here starts when at least one of the functions is non-convex, because all of the sudden you can have local optima or even local infeasibilities. And uh, looking at the, the picture over here on the lower right, you have two points which are highest in their surrounding, like uh, this point here and this point there, but only one of them is highest overall. The other one is a local optimum. Also with non-convexities, the straightforward continuous relaxation does not buy you anything anymore. For example, non-convexity can easily create disconnected areas already for the continuous part. Uh, like in this example that we see on the next slide, which I would like to use to explain once more the difference between local and global optimality. If you look at, uh, at the picture, this is a continuous NAP created by two non-convex inequality constraints. The feasible region decomposes into six individual regions. <clears throat> Those are these dark blue areas that you see over there. And if you take the red line or the red arrow, if you wish, as a linear objective function. And this prob problem will have a total of nine local optima 
these are the red dots and there is one global optimum that is the one red dot that's slightly uh, slightly darker so and this uh, global optimum is the one unique point with the lowest objective value in the feasible region all the other red points are only locally optimal in the sense that in their neighborhood there is no better solution but you have to move further away to get out of this local minimum and to a region with better objective value and in the convex case such situations cannot exist you can uh, in the convex case always move into a better direction unless you are globally optimal okay if you now consider this as an MANLP, so you require integrality on both of the variables, you will find that there are a total of five feasible solutions. Those are um, yeah, on the integer grid and shaded slightly green. And the global opti optimum of the MANLP sits right there in the middle. And if for the whole presentation so far, you thought express and nonlinear, I've heard that one before. You're correct. Uh, we've had a nonlinear solver in our uh, Express solver portfolio for over a decade, but that one is a local solver. It will find you a local optimum. So Express nonlinear uses some tricks like Multistar to increase the chance of finding a good local optimum, but you might still miss the global optimum. And even when you, when you find it, you will not get a guarantee of its quality or of its global optimality and the express global on the other hand finds provably global optimal solutions to both convex and non-convex NLPs and MINLPs and from a product perspective uh, this will be the distinction express nonlinear refers to our SAP server potentially plus Nitro and this different uh, when it comes to licensing and uh, these things from express global which we first to our global server. And this also makes sense from a technical perspective since Express Nonlinear is mostly coded as a solver of its own, which uses the LP solver as a subroutine, while Express Global is tightly integrated directly into our uh, MIP server. Um, so those two are different entities, but one uses the other and both handle the same types of nonlinearities. And you might wonder by now which nonlinearities these are um well for example these ones and to put it a, bit, a little more precisely all combinations of the following operators are valid obviously basic arithmetic operations plus minus simply gives linear functions adding multiplications gives you polynomials and division gives rational functions next are all trigonometric functions and their inverse functions and we also support exponential functions and logarithms exponents and of course roots and finally also generally modeling contracts uh, constructs can be used like uh, absolute values maximum minimum over some terms piecewise linear and finally the so-called error function which is important in probability and thermodynamics and combine all of these in an arbitrary fashion to get your favorite nonlinear functions, just like the ones that you see on top of this slide. Okay, we will now finally get into the question of how you solve such uh, monsters of optimization problems. And the maybe surprising answer is that you might already know almost all ingredients, at least if you know how MIPS are solved, how a MIPS solver basically works. So the principal components are yeah, simply the same, just always with a little nonlinear twist to them. Those are cutting planes that are involved here. You will see some special branching schemes. Um, Pre-serving and bow tightening plays an even more important um, role than uh, in the MIP case. And the only thing which might be really new here, but it's a cool thing and really useful is that you present your problem as a graph and that's the prompt to hand over to my uh, dear colleague Tristan who did a lot of the implementation for the global solver and will guide you through the rest of the presentation thanks Timo so what is FICO Express Global 
Well, as we already mentioned, it's a new solver building on our existing MIP and nonlinear technology that allows us to find globally optimal solutions to general nonlinear problems. Now, it uses both the MIP and the nonlinear part, namely, it uses the nonlinear part mainly on the API level for building the problem. So, in particular, this means if you are already using FICO Express SLP or uh, Atlas Nitro, then this means that there is no change required to your model, and all you need to do to switch over to the global solver is to change a single control value. Similarly, as Timo already mentioned, this means that all of our existing analytical functions are also supported by the global solver, the one exception being user functions. On the other hand, the actual solve itself mostly uses ARM technology. So how does an high-level overview look like? Well, first of all, we start to read in the problem, as mentioned through our existing nonlinear API, and then just as if we were solving using SLP, we'll perform a nonlinear pre-solve. After that, the first point where we diff uh, differ from what an SLP solve would have done, that we will reformulate the problem using auxiliary variables. The idea here is that using these new variables, that we can formulate the problem as a linear problem in these new variables and stash away the relationship, our nonlinear relationship between these variables. Then on this linear problem in the auxiliary variables, we can now perform a MIP pre solve. And afterwards, we start our root LP, or in some cases, we might also include some convex quadratic information and end up with a second or a cone, a general convex quadratic problem that we can now solve with an initial set of so-called convexification cuts to improve uh, our linear relaxation. Now, if this problem is unbounded, we'll have to use some specific approaches to uh, enforce boundedness, which we'll discuss later. After that, we will perform a tree search just like in MIP case, just with a few additional modules that we need to enforce our nonlinearities. So, in particular, there are additional propagation methods, as well as the already mentioned communication cuts that allow us to enforce the nonlinearities. Unlike the MIP case, in the nonlinear case, we might, it might not be sufficient to only branch on integer variables, but you might also need to branch on continuous variables to enforce the nonlinearities. And as mentioned, we not only use our MIP solver, but we also use our existing local NLP solvers. In this case, we can use them as heuristics whenever we find MIP feasible solutions to extend them to MINLP solutions. So how do these steps look in detail? So let's start with some nonlinear constraint, like in this case, two to the power of cosine of x squared. And the first step is to represent this using a so-called expression tree. So in this case, we start with an initial a node that corresponds to the power function, in this case with a base of two, an exponent of the cosine, which again has another child, namely another power function, in this case for x squared. Now we could do the same for every single uh, or every single nonlinear constraint in our model, or we try to combine these into a so-called direct acyclic graph, where the idea is that if, for example, uh, we have specific uh, nonlinear formulas that repeat, so, for example, if in addition to this constraint, we would have another constraint that x squared plus y squared should be less or equal to 5, then we would not introduce two distinct nodes for these x squares, but would instead have a single node corresponding to x squared, which then had two parent nodes, one being the cosine and the other one, the sum was the y squared. Why would we do this? Well, because the next step, we now want to introduce auxiliary variables for these nodes. Then, of course, it is preferential to only have a single variable corresponding to x squared itself multiple of those. So next step, now for each of these interior nodes, we would introduce auxiliary variables. So for example, a1 would now correspond to x squared. Then the next step, the cosine of x squared now simply becomes the cosine of a1. That should now correspond to a2. And a3 will then finally be 2 to the power of a2. Now what this allows us is to reformulate our original nonlinear constraint now as a simple linear constraint that a3 should be less or equal to 1. Now of course we still somehow need to enforce these remaining nonlinear relationships between our variables. But the first point where we can do this is we can try to use this direct acyclic graph to perform an initial bound reduction. So we know that a3 should be less or equal to 1, and we know that a3 should be 2 to the power of a2. So together, that implies that a2 needs to be less or equal than the logarithm to base 2 of a3. Now, if a3 is supposed to be less or equal to 1, then this needs to be less or equal to the logarithm of 1, so a2 needs to be 0. So already when we introduce the new auxiliary variable a2, we would immediately introduce it with an upper bound of 0. Then, of course, in the next step, we could further follow the DAG and then 
propagate this further to A1 and finally to X. Now, of course, we will not only do this once in the beginning, but we can do this repeatedly whenever any of the bounds change. So for example, if later on we will branch on X, then of course we could use the same ideas to propagate this through all of our auxiliary variables. Now, once we have reformulated the problem in this way, then we could solve the linear relaxation that this enforces. Now, of course, doing that alone might not be very meaningful because, of course, the nonlinearities may still be very coarsely represented. One way to enforce these is that, similar to the MIP case, we can again try to introduce cutting planes that enforce these additional constraints. Now, what this means in our case is that those are just linear over our underestimations of individual nodes of our directed acyclic graph. So, if we think back about the previous example, we would have uh, a single node that represents the fact that a1 should equal x squared. So, in this case, we would just try to enforce this single function here. Now, in this case, that, um, because in our previous example, this would then enter some cosine function. We might in general need to enforce equality, meaning we both need to enforce that a1 should be greater or equal x squared and that it's less or equal. Now the greater or equal part in this case is the slightly easier one because it's the convex part of it. So in this case, we can apply these kind of auto approximation cuts. Now the other half is more difficult because of the non-convexity, so we have to use these kind of convexification cuts. Now, as you can already see here, these are very much dependent on the bounds. So in particular, if we didn't have any initial bounds on X, then we would not actually be able to create any kind of these cuts. So the problem would probably end up being unbounded, which already shows that also from a user perspective, it's very important to provide as many bounds as possible on the original variables. Now, when do we do this? Well, the first step is before solving the root LP, but there are also more places where we can do this. So in particular for the auto approximation cuts, you can already see here, that in general, there's an infinite number of those that we could add. Now, of course, we don't want to do this because that might make the LP hard to solve. So in the initial uh, relaxation, we'll only apply a handful of those. And then in the root cut loop or later also node cut loop. So when it actually turns out that we uh, generate LP solutions that violate these cuts, then we will try to separate additional cuts to improve the uh, approximation where necessary. So for example, if we end up with an LP solution somewhere here, we might create additional cuts at that point. Later on, we can also use these cuts and branching evaluation. So for most of the operators that Timo introduced previously, we implemented the standard secant and tangent cuts, which you can see here. However, for some more important operators, so in particular for quadratics, we implemented some more involved types of cuts like McCormick or of the tangent cuts. Of course, this gives us a general framework that we can now improve on with each new release. So in particular, if you're currently trying to solve some kind of non-quadratic problems, would like to solve them to global optimality, you don't yet see the uh, performance you were hoping for, then please talk to us and then we can try to uh, implement better cards for these specific type of operators that you're seeing in your applications as soon as possible. So as we've already seen, one issue with convexication cuts is that they can be very much dependent on the particular bounds. So in particular, if you look at the solution 0, 1, you won't actually be able to cut it off with the, same, uh, with the convexification cuts within the current bounds without also cutting off feasible solutions. So the only point to improve these kind of convexification cuts and enable tighter convexification cuts is to improve our bounds, and one way of doing so is branching. So in this case, we will not only need to branch on integer variables like in the mixed integer linear case, but we will also branch on continuous variables, so-called spatial branchings. So for this express global, it's an additional module that can create spatial branching candidates for each variable in a violated term of a violated nonlinear constraint. Now, unlike the linear case, it's a lot less clear here how to actually, or at what point to actually branch. So in the mixed integer linear case, when you have a fractional variable, you pretty much always just want to round up and round down to your current variable value to create new entities that are to create two new sub problems that will cut off your existing solution. Now, in the mixed integer nonlinear case, this no longer works as nicely simply because you cannot round. You might still want to try to branch on your existing solution simply because this has the highest likelihood of actually cutting off your solution, even though that's not generally guaranteed. Now, the issue with this is that. If your solution happens to be very close to your bounds, the worst case, it could happen that you just improve your lower or upper bound 
by a very small epsilon for each branching. Now, the other extreme would be to just branch on the domain midpoint, so the midpoint between lower and upper bound of your variable. This, of course, gives you the largest reduction in the domain. But on the other hand, if your solution does happen to be at one of the extremes of your domain, then the cuts you add might be very far away from the area that you actually care about. So what we do to combine both of these is that we will branch on a convex combination of those two. Now, one specific case here is that if you have a complementarity constraint, so product with right-hand side zero, then of course, this simply enforces that either X should be equal to zero or Y should be equal to zero. So that's the branching we've created in these cases. Now, once we have created such branching candidates, then of course, the question is on which of those do we actually want to branch? For this, we use the same technology as we do in the MIP case. So it's some combination of strong branching history costs as well as some tiebreaker rules. Now, the one difference to the MIP case is that, of course, here, uh, the strength of the branching doesn't really come from the uh, variable bonds themselves, but mainly from the tight track classification cuts as well as propagation that they enable. So to be able to measure this, we will perform some, uh, some amount of cutting and propagation directly on the branching candidates before we actually evaluate them. So for example, the strong branching would already include some of the cuts we will generate. At the moment, there's no general preference between integer and spatial branching. So for both cases, we'll just uh, generate the candidates and then evaluate them using our existing technology and see which of the two um, promises the bigger improvements. What we do have a general preference is that we'll usually branch on original rather than auxiliary variables. So in our original example, we would rather branch on X than on the AI variables that we introduced. Although this is generally a dynamic decision, so if it's uh, if auxiliary branchings promised good uh, improvements on the route, we might decide to include them as well. So how does this look in practice? Well, let's assume that we go back now to our cosine. So we now want to enforce that y should be greater or equal to the cosine of x. And due to some other constraints or the objective of our problem, we might want to minimize y. Now, of course, y doesn't need to be an actual variable of our original problem, but it might again be one of the auxiliaries that we introduced earlier. Now, what can we do here with regards to cutting? Well, the only thing we can really do is we can say that y should be greater or equal to minus one. But everything that would try to cut off, for example, this part of the feasible region would also necessarily cut off either parts of the actual min LP feasible region. So what will the LP solution look like? Well, with just a single linear constraint, no variant bounds, there's not much to work with. So we might end up with a super basic solution like this. Now, as we've already discussed, we can't really cut this off with further uh, cuts. So we may need to branch on it. So let's assume that in this case, due to the non-existence of bounds, we'll just branch on this case, on this variable. Now, does that really change much? Well, at first, not really. Actually, our solution will still be feasible at this point for both branching entities. But it will allow, what it allows us to do is to introduce new convexification cuts for those branches. So if you look at the app branch, suddenly this kind of convexification cuts uh, becomes possible. This, of course, cuts off parts of our original feasible, uh, feasible region, but none of the feasible region of the subproblem. And of course, it's a much better approximation of our original nonlinear constraint than what we had before. And of course, due to symmetry, we can do the same for the down branch. So let's now investigate the up branch. Then in this case, of course, we might get a much better LP solution. So for example, this one here. Now, unlike the previous case, we actually have a local convexity in this part here. So we can actually use an outer approximation cut, just cut it off like this. And then in the next case, we might already get an LP solution that happens to be within feasibility tolerance for our nonlinear constraint. Of course, there's no guarantee. It might be that the solution could end up somewhere here. Then we might have to do another branching to, again, uh, improve our relaxation in that region. Now, in the worst case, we might have to branch until we have a um, small enough uh, feasible region for our LP. So in the worst case, until the domain is just some epsilon, and then we could guarantee that any LP feasible solution due to the complication cuts and propagation would actually need to be within feasibility tolerance also for the nonlinear constraint. Now, of course, just like in the MILP case, we would not want to look at all of these cases. So the hope is that we'll 
relatively quickly find a good solution. And then afterwards, we can cut off a lot of these racial branching candidates because the LPR extension guarantees that we can't find a better solution than what we already have. Now, of course, for that to work out, we need good feasible solutions. So that brings us to heuristics. Now, of course, any heuristics that we could run in the MIP case, we can still run in the MINRP case. But of course, since they will not be aware of the nonlinear part, chances are that they will only find a MIP feasible solution that happens to be nonlinear and feasible. Now, whenever that happens, we can now try to go back to our existing local NLP solvers. So what we can do is we can just fix all of the integer variables and then solve the remaining non continuous nonlinear problem. Of course, there's no guarantee that this problem is still feasible. And in particular, if we run the local solver, obviously we only get a local solution. And that's not much different from the MILP case where the heuristics are also never guaranteed to actually find your optimal solution. Nevertheless, if we do this frequently, la fre frequently enough with the further improvements that we get to our model deeper in the tree, then at some point we should end up with finding a good and at some point even the optimal solution this way. Now, one thing I mentioned before that can cause issues here is unboundedness of our root relaxation. This is not so much a problem in mixed interlinear programming, where you can actually show from a theoretical point of view that whenever you have an unbounded uh, LP relaxation, then under mild conditions, actually your MILP has to be unbounded as well. Now, in the nonlinear case, this is different in general. So if we would just relax the nonlinear constraints here, then of course the problem would become unbounded. Now, in our case, we will, of course, apply some initial bound propagation as well as communication cuts, which in most cases should ensure that our root LP will actually be bounded. However, this is still dependent on the initial bounds on our original variables, which, of course, reiterates how important those will be if you want to solve these problems in practice. So what would we do if the problem would actually turn out to be unbounded? Well, what we can try is we can impose artificial bounds on the original variables, try again, hoping that this will make the problem unbounded. If not, we might have to do the same again for auxiliary variables, which then, of course, increase the likelihood of us cutting off the op optimal solution. So what this means is that in those cases, we can only guarantee that we will find the best solution within those bounds. But better solutions might exist outside of those bounds, so we will only report feasibility instead of optimality. So this is the one case where we cannot guarantee global optimality. But as mentioned, this is very much a corner case and should rather be seen as a warning that the original variables that were provided with the model were insufficient and should try should be inf um, improved in a second attempt. Now, all of this is, of course, um, possible to change from your side as well. So in particular, we um, provide the global bounding box control that both allows you to vary the value of these uh, bounds that we enforce as well as completely disable this approach and just report unboundedness instead. So how does this compare to our existing offering? Well, as already mentioned multiple times, FICO Express Global, as the name says, allows you to obtain global optimal solutions for your problems compared to the local ones that SLP or Nitro could produce. Now, this does not only apply to the solutions, but it also applies to the bounds that we can provide. So FICO Express Global will actually provide you a duality or optimality gap just like you know it from the mixed integer linear case, while the local solvers could not provide any general bounds on your optimal solution. For mixed integer SLP or also Nitro runs, you can of course get an estimate on the global op on the optimal solution, but this is only locally valid since the bound was obtained with a local solver. So there's no guarantee that there couldn't be better solutions elsewhere. Well now, you again, like in the mixed linear case, you both know your current solution and how good the solution could still be get. So this gives you a hint whether it might be worthwhile to continuing the solve or whether you're already quite, quite close to the optimum anyways. Now, one additional difference is that, as mentioned already, we don't support user functions. And of course, a big difference is in how the problems look internally. So on the SLP side, for example, you roughly get one variable per constraint and one per variable both of which only applying to the nonlinear parts of the problem. While for FICO Express Global, you will get an auxiliary for every single node of the directed acyclic graph. So in particular, this means that if you have a deeply nested formula, like the one before, where you have first uh, an exponent, then a cosine, and then another square, you could get three variables for a single nonlinear constraint. So this, together with the fact that we might have to branch on continuous variables, 
means that in general, global source can take significantly longer than local source. Of course, there's not a general guarantee for this. So in particular, if you have mixed integer problems, it can sometimes happen that the global actually finds a solution and solves the problems even to global optimality quicker than SLP can. But of course, that's more of the exception than the norm. Now, that of course doesn't mean that there are no use cases for the global solver. So for example, if you have a problem with a huge linear core and very few nonlinear constraints, such a case most of the time will be spent on the mixed integer part of the problem anyways. So a few spatial branchings might not cost you too much time. So for example, if we look at this problem here, you can see that actually fixing a single variable will already get rid of all of the nonlinearities and afterwards you just have regular MILT to solve. Also one difference here is how badly behaved the nonlinearities are. So if you have a very complicated, very non-convex nonlinearity, it might take a while until you have branched for far enough that your linear approximations actually become close enough that an LP solution actually becomes an LP feasible with intolerances as well. On the other hand, for other type of constraints where there's very few uh, non-convexities, might actually be the case that just a single or a handful of branchings already allow you to get a nice approximation of them. And one thing you might be aware of for local solves is that you can do multi-starts to generate different local solutions at different points of the region in the hope to find one that is somewhat close to global optimal. Now, of course, something similar can happen with a, a global solver. So in particular, as mentioned, we will run uh, our local solvers for SLP or Nitro at different points of the search to generate feasible solutions. Now, this, in a way, can be seen as an advanced multi-start as it will allow you to get different local solutions coming from different starting points. Now, unlike the existing multi-start um, methodology, this is not random in the way where you try to generate your starting points, but instead you will start from points that uh, correspond to uh, optimal solutions of your LP relaxations or that were found by MIP solutions, so that have a higher likelihood of generating good MI NLP solutions as well. And finally, of course, whenever you need a reliable bound on the optimal value, then there's simply no other way to obtain them than using a global solver. So how can you actually call the global solver? Well, as already mentioned, if you have an existing nonlinear problem, there's nothing more you need to do except for changing a single control value. Or alternatively, whatever optimization methods you use, whether it's the new XPRS optimized that you can use both for linear, mixed integer, or mixed integer nonlinear problems, or whether it's the existing XPRS or XSLP NLP optimized, you only have to add an X flag to get global optimality in the end. If you want to try it, please go ahead and write an email to this address to get an evaluation license. And if you want further information, you can also check out our documentation here. So let's now look at some practical example for this. So for this, we will look at an instance from the MI NLP lib, where the idea is that given this kind of problem here, we want to find the largest squares such that all four vertices of the square are contained in the graph of this trigonometric function here. That of course means that also the, uh, pre the um, formulation of the problem will include trigonometrics, of course. This kind of problem is closely related to the so-called triplet conjecture, which asks whether such a square always exists for every plain simple closed curve. While this curve is not simple, so it shows a way how to actually evaluate the conjecture for a given function. In this case, we don't only ask for the existence of a square, but we actually want to find the largest one. Now, of course, this is not exactly a huge problem. Actually, you can uh, formulate this using only nine variables. So it's a very highly non-convex one. So as you can imagine, it's quite hard to even find any solution here. And even once you have found a solution in general, you won't be able to proceed from one feasible solution to another one without leaving the feasible region. So in fact, each of the feasible solutions will be isolated in this case. That of course means that the usual way for a local solver to go from one feasible solution to a better one will not be possible here, which shows why it might be important to use a, a global solver instead. So how can we do this? So let's just start press solver from the console and read the problem in. Now for this example, I want to use SLP rather than Nitro. So I enforce it using the local solver control. 
then just call our optimize function, which will automatically figure out this is a nonlinear problem. So we want to have a nonlinear solve. If we do this, then for this maximization problem, you can see that we find an objective value in the roughly 0.5 region within a few hundreds of seconds. Now, what happens if we would want it to solve it with global optimality instead? So let's read the problem in again. Then we just set the global solve control. Now, if I can call optimize again, I could just provide the X option to enforce the global solve, but in this case, actually not necessary since I already set the corresponding control. You can just call optimize. Now you already see solve takes a lot longer, but we've already found a solution that's actually slightly better than what SLP found. And we now also have a bound and a duality gap. Then after some time, we actually could solve the problem to optimality. And we see that in this case, we found a significantly better solution that SLP found before. But if we now go back to the beginning, we can see that within the first second, so in somewhat similar time frame to what SLP did before, we find a solution that's already slightly better than SLP. And we now also get a viable bound. So we can uh, evaluate how good our solution actually is and whether we're happy to stick with this or whether we want to continue to actually find a global solution. And of course, the longer we continue, we see that the bound improves. So we see that our solution wasn't actually as bad as we first thought. And then in the end, we actually have to find a better solution and we can find finally show that this is actually globally optimal so that there can't be any better solutions. Now, if we go back to our presentation, here we can also see in the picture how the SLP solution compares to the global one or also the natural one as a third example. So first of all, we see that if you solve the same kind of problem with two different local solvers, they might find similar solutions, but in general, they won't find the same ones. But of course, for a global solver, and then get the global option. This also gives you another sense of what locality means in this case. So actually one of the uh, or four of the variables of the formulation are the points on these curves. And if you think about it, it's particularly if you compare one of the locals and the global solution, there's no easy way to get from here to here directly on a single curve. You actually have to jump along that curve to find another feasible solution. And that's why the local solvers will not be able to actually obtain the global optimality in this case. Now, why do we call it a beta version? Well, one thing here is that um, we currently mainly allow you to solve a single problem with a single solve. So in particular, there's no full, um, you don't fully support all of the different callbacks you all know from our mixed and linear solver in their entirety. Also, it's currently not possible to just interrupt and then resume a global solve. One thing I mentioned at the beginning is that the global solver at the moment mostly uses a nonlinear API. So in particular, you should also query nonlinear solutions rather than LP or MIP solutions. Or of course, you can use the new XPRS get solution functionality that will work independently of whether we have an LP, MIP, or nonlinear problem. Now, these things are things that we plan to improve on uh, during the next releases. But one thing that's probably not going to change soon is that we don't support user functions in our global solver. Why do we do that? Don't why don't we do that? Well, it's it's fairly simple to uh, support user functions for a derivative-based solver like SLP or like natural. All you really need is a way to evaluate the function. Of course, you also need to evaluate um, the derivatives at some point, but even if the, this is not directly provided by the user function, you can just compute numerical derivatives. Now, as we saw for a global solver to work, you really need to be able to propagate bounds through your user function, as well as create convexification cuts. Now, bound propagation is something that's also used by SLP, but even if you would disable that, solves might take a little bit longer and you might run into a few more numerical issues. But in general, most of the problems you would be perfectly able to solve without bound propagation through SLP. Now, for global solver, that's different. If you just disable bound propagation and communication cuts for global solver, you'll probably no longer be able to solve even trivial problems. You'll probably just branch to eternity. That's why there is not really much sense in supporting user functions for a global solver without these two things. So if we would want to support them, the user functions would need to be able to propagate bounds through them and um, provide over and under asymmetries as well. So if you have a problem that you includes user function that you would want to solve to global optimality, you think you could provide these two, then by all means talk to us and we will see if we can enable this. 
But at the moment, we don't necessarily expect to support these in the near future simply because it would put a significantly larger burden on the users compared to uh, the user functions that we for support for SLP. So with that, I can give back to Timo for some final announcements. Okay, thanks Tristan for this very nice presentation and the uh, demo at the end. So um, we are coming to the final part of this video. I would like to point out some announcements. So the first is the Express Best Paper Award. This is an academic award that honors great scientifically variable publications that use FICO Express. So this can be a paper in one of the well-known OR, MS, or optimization journals, but also a paper that is published in a thoroughly reviewed conference proceedings can be on solving new types of problems or developing new application specific algorithms that solve optimization sub problems by Express. Or it can be a paper on um, new mathematical optimization methods based on an Express callback implementation or really all other imaginable research where using Express optimization products played a significant role. And the authors of the winning paper will be awarded a price of $1,500. And for the first edition of the award, all papers will qualify that are published within the year 2021 or 2022. So there was either some more time to cross the finish line if you watch this video right after it has been released. Otherwise, uh, you might rather look into the next editions of the award. So there will also be one in the year after, where then papers from 2023 will also qualify. Okay, um, the submission deadline is always the end of January. And if you have any questions, you can send them to the named email address there. And then the second announcement uh, is that there will be an interesting workshop in Berlin in uh, April, 2023, where FICO is the main sponsor and my colleague Susanna Heipke and I are two of the main organizers. And this is the Euro Practitioners Forum. Um, this is a meeting for people from all different kinds of industries that use optimization, analytics, and other OR tools. And the topic of this particular meeting next year is, be, is OR as a resilient technology. So something like lessons that we learned from the various crises of the recent years, be it the pandemic, the war, energy crisis. So... There will be speakers from uh, large supply chain companies, from Euro's largest gas network provider, and a presentation on nurse scheduling, most likely also something on finance. So everything from practice, from people working in the industry at companies. So register for free. Send your abstracts. Uh, the submission deadline has been prolonged until mid-January. And uh, yeah, then come to Berlin in April. Yeah, and this is the end of the presentation. Thanks a lot for watching through this video. Um, contact us if you want to participate in the Express Global Beta program and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.